Yep. I think we're good we're already. Good. Okay. Uh, actually, let me check. Yeah, but I think we're good. Okay. Can I ask both Chris and Patrick to go back and test if the Twitch is working? Uh, I'm on the page now. Just to confirm that it's actually a webcast. That's what I was going to do was like draw something and just show that. And I was just kind of curious. There's some other yeah, yeah, commercial applications. Uh, Here's a webcam I just put the tape on. It's starting to see $12. Because that would probably help. So, exactly like, what program would you use to capture the webcam? Yeah, that was the thing. Just put it on the CD. Oh, oh, oh. Like, Windows all. I'll probably use package manager. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was a good Save it later. Uh, uh, probably in the product that didn't come with the user manual. And for $12. I think we're buying it for you. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, I got the thing for a yep. price. Yeah. On okay. Okay. okay, cool. It's a color manual. It's a color manual. Print it very easily. Okay. Um, so, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for having me here today. I'm Ben Chang. Um, I teach up at RPI um, in the art department, um, and I teach game development and 3D animation, um, and occasionally I teach some of the intro art classes, drawing, stuff like that. Um, my background is kind of half art and half programming computer science, um, and I kind of do a, a little bit of a lot of different things, um, both with games and interactive art of different kinds. Um, and just as a brief introduction, I'm um, going to bring up my website and show a few of the projects that I've, um, that I've done, some of which are games and some of which are um, interactive pieces that are uh, kind of game-like. Uh, so, hmm? those, are, those are games, yeah. I, have a, I, you know, I think we're at a, at a point where we can have a fairly expansive definition of like the notion of, uh, of game. Um, so this is something I've been working on recently uh, called New Atlantis. It's a um, multi-user kind of like shared sandbox world, kind of like Second Life, um, but largely for audio experimentation. Uh, and so it's this like big collaborative world where people can make objects and sounds and interactive things and uh, I'll upload them together and rearrange them and build environments together. Um, and then we do these like network performances between different cities and so it's um, kind of like an experimental music conference. Uh, uh, it's called New Atlantis. Um, okay, I can show you the, pull up the website for that real fast. New Atlantis. Uh, world right here. Um, yeah, so it's still, I mean, it's still really in like early, I don't even know if I would call it beta. <laughs> Yeah, but it, in the functionality is there. The um, you know it's in that, in that stage where the interface is still like programmer UI, right? Um, to work with it, but it all um, but it all works. No, um, so, yeah, it's based on this utopian novel by uh, by Francis Bacon uh, about this island that he found out in the Pacific. He gets shipwrecked on called, called New Atlantis, which is home to this um, kind of like perfect society with all these amazing technological achievements. Um, and it's a really boring novel because it's basically just this guy getting a tour of all the cool stuff they have on the island, um, like the house of, uh, of optical image effects and then the house that contains like all possible plants of the world and um, then the house that, that is called the sound house that has all of these magical devices for storing and manipulating and playing sound, which is like basically they have um, invented like the iPhone um, in, in New Atlantis. But, uh, but anyway, so that's that's one of the things that I've been um, that I've been working on lately. Um, say, I do a lot of work with VR, uh, both the stuff with like the Oculus Rift and the Vive, um, and also with uh, projection-based VR. So things where you're doing like 3D projection on the walls around you um, in uh, this this kind of system called a cave. Uh, and other things like that, uh, instead of the, the head mount idea. Um, anyway, but 
So, uh, so my website is bcjane.com, and you can come check out some of my other pieces later on. Um, but tonight I'm going to talk about Krita, uh, which is a digital painting, digital imaging program. Um, it's, a, it's a free open source tool for doing all kinds of things, mostly with raster graphics, um, bitmap graphics. I mean, as opposed to the vector uh, stuff that you would use in a program like Illustrator. Uh, it's free, it's open source, uh, it's cross-platform. You can run it on Windows and on Linux and on Mac. Um, it's a thing, I got really excited about this last year, which I think is when I proposed this tutorial <laughs> um, up into like, the list of, of lesson plans, um, because uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of open source, particularly um, for doing creative, um, creative work. Uh, I think there's uh, a lot of kind of like flexibility, a lot of power that you get from having a set of open source uh, tools in your toolbox in addition to the, um, the proprietary software, the commercial software we all use. Um, and so I'm always really excited when a new tool kind of comes on the scene. Um, and Krita is one that's been around for a while but kind of under the radar um, in the open source graphics uh, world. You all may have heard of GIMP, which is um, the new image manipulation program. Um, and so like that one's probably the most well-known digital uh, imaging, drawing, painting program. Um, and it's really great, but it's really nice to have something else that's like a kind of a full-featured professional digital painting software that's come out uh, or really started to get built up uh, recently so that there's uh, some variety of tools you've got available to you. Um, uh, so I'll say, uh, Krita has, uh, you know, again, been around for, um, for quite a while, but kind of like got this big boost in, in recent years uh, with developing a lot more features and a lot more um, particularly uh, uh, real professional features targeting uh, professional illustrators. Um, so it actually comes out of the Linux world, uh, like a lot of uh, open source stuff. Um, its origins come out as part of the KDE project. Um, so KDE is a Linux desktop uh, environment, um, one of the two major ones, that one and, and, um, and GNOME uh, are the two major sort of like desktop uh, worlds. And, and, and KDE has a sort of this whole ecosystem of software um, that is developed, you know, that gets developed along with it. Productivity apps, um, imaging apps, audio, video editing, uh, all kinds of things um, as one sort of cohesive thing. So if you want to use that in its native environment, uh, you mean you can use it in any Linux distribution. Uh, one of my favorites is this one, uh, Kubuntu, which is the KDE spin or version of, uh, of Ubuntu, um, and has uh, programs like Krita and a lot of other things just kind of like nicely integrated into that, uh, into that desktop experience. Um, so oh, I just wanted to a little bit about that so you can get some background on where this, uh, where this is coming from. So um, it's a program I, like, I first encountered probably about like maybe like eight or nine years ago when it was like this very simple little drawing thing and it just kind of like existed as this thing you could get with your KDE distro. Um, and, and I think at some point they got a bunch of Google Summer of Code funding um, and like a few other funding sources in it to really, um, really kick it up a notch. And so that's where uh, where we've gotten to today. Um, so that's what we'll be, um, we'll be experimenting with. Um, I'm going to go through some basic, um, you know, sort of a basic survey of the tools, cover some basic arts, um, like art concepts. Um, also some great ways of cheating so that you don't have to actually know those art concepts that well, but we'll, Krita will do them for you, particularly around things like perspective, which is always really hard. Um, and then uh, some things that are like really specific to, or specifically useful for games, um, in addition to doing stuff like concept art and character portrait illustration and background illustration and stuff like that, uh, there's a few things built into Krita that are really good for doing texture painting um, and uh, some stuff that can be really useful for doing uh, pixel art style. Um, and uh, in a really new development, they've also had animation into this. So you can use it as a frame by frame, uh, like hand drawn cell animation uh, thing, which is actually also also really cool. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead and get right uh, right down to it. So. 
So, uh, quick question. Yes. Oh, sorry. Does Prima it does support tablets? Right? Yes. So Prima does support tablets. Um, that's sort of like the ideal way to use it, particularly if you're doing uh, real digital painting, because it has pressure sensitivity built into it. So you can get like really nice variation to your line and your paint stroke um, if you're using a tablet. Um, of course, you don't have to use a tablet. You can just use it with a mouse or a uh, touchpad uh, or whatever. But the tablet um, does give you a lot of extra nice features. Uh, I'll say one of those that's that's really cool is the um, is the tilt feature. So if you have a really nice graphics tablet um, that can sense the tilt on your pen, uh, you can use that for normal mapping. So it has this thing where you can like paint normal maps um, directly I know, right um, into it, and the tilt of your pen will control like how it's carving into the image um, in the normal map directly. Yeah, I know. Right? Like that's, I, don't, I don't think my tablet actually will do the tilt thing, but I'll show you where it, where it is because it's totally nuts. Um, I don't actually entirely understand how it works, um, and, but it's a it's a fairly new thing. It's this plugin that was like made by some college student like over the summer last year, and it just blows my mind. Um, anyhow, uh, let's get started. So hmm, the uh, just to let you know, John's computer. Okay, I was going to say that these icons are kind of small. Um, yeah. Would it? Do you think it would help if I drop the resolution? Right. Closing and reopening it again. Because sometimes, like, uh, yeah, uh, search for like magnifying glass icons. I did set it to 1080. No, is it still funky? Yeah, it's a little bit. Funky. You know, I think the resolution on this is higher than the resolution of the projector. Yeah. That's probably what's going on. Uh, let's see. Then you could just Display change the. Settings. Excuse the technical. Yeah, so do you want to just fix this real quick? Make sure that John um, what happened is everything looks like it should be working on the street as well. Looks is that better? Better. That's a can little bit use it? a little bit better, yeah. Um, we can use the magnifying I, I have not had luck with that. Um, change the size of text. What are you looking for? Oh, it's just checking the, the resolution for the projector as well. It's it's duplicating. So yeah, so that should be... We've had issues with that projector. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to make sure it's a screen properly. Uh, it looks like it, it's just display capture, so yeah. it's streaming fine. Yeah. This is kind uh, of would it also help to have the magnify tool open? I know you said earlier, John. You know, it's it's not going to work. With, I mean, this projector is just not that great. Yes. Well, no, the magnify is supposed to let you like zoom into certain spots. It's not meant to. I, I messed around with it before we started streaming. It's not going to oh, do that okay. much. Then, then never mind. Sorry about that. Yeah, I've had, I've had issues with it. Yeah, I was just going to see if there's a way to adjust the um, theme on this. Yeah, that's a checkerboard pattern. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's fun, except that the text on the menus will be a little bit hard to read. Yeah, well, that's the projector's fault, yeah. Yeah. which is... Yes. I can't really do much about On the window, the further user interface is too small on my API API screen. If you are using Windows, you can set the display scale to 150 or 200% and enable the experimental Can you, can you just use this? Like, is this usable? Yes. Yes. For, for me, it's totally fine, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. We're fine, Taro. All right. Hmm? We're fine. All right. We're, we're just, we're just yeah. going with it. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, get started. So I'm going I'm to begin by creating a new document. So, uh, so this is under the file menu and new right here. Um, so here you'll see a few different options. Uh, the first one is uh, custom document. So here you would set your resolution um, and different settings by hand. Um, and underneath that, create from clipboard. So this is useful if you've copied an image either from a document in Krita or from elsewhere. So if you do something like copy an image off of a web page, um, and then it'll paste directly into Krita and create a new document from that. Um, and you can see there's a few templates down here as well. Um, so uh, the animation templates, you would use these if you want to set up um, templates that look like old school uh, cell animation sheets. Um, the comic templates, you can use these to basically set up like a grid for doing, um, for doing comics. Um, another one that's really useful down here is the texture templates, uh, which just give you default sizes that are good for doing textures for, um, for 3D modeling. Uh, but for right now, I'm just going to go to the, um, the custom document on right here. Um, it's going to default to making a 1600 by 1200 pixel image at 300 dpi, which is fine. Um, underneath that, for the color model, it's set to RGB slash alpha. Uh, so what that means, RGB, red, green, and blue, is this sort of the typical way that most um, images are stored on the computer. Um, and alpha means that the image will have transparency or the option of using transparency. Um, Bit depth over here is set to 8-bit integer for channel, per channel, which is normal uh, for like most, uh, most images. You can see that there are, are options under here for doing 16-bit floats or 32-bit floats if you want to do really high resolution um, color space things uh, in there. So uh, for most of the stuff we'll, we'll do in here, you just leave it at 8 bits, um, 8 bits per channel. But you have this whole extra kind of like high-end um, color space range of options if you ever need them. All right, so I'll go ahead and hit create. And I've got this image right here. Um, over on the left, this is your toolbox. You can see I've got the paintbrush selected right now. Um, and you can just go and click and do some painting. Um, up at the top, we have some controls that will adjust the paintbrush, so like this size slider right here. If I drag that down, you can get a very thin line like that. And then as I bring it up, it gets really, really thick. Uh, over here on the right, you've got your color selector. Um, so the way this thing works is that you drag around this circle to do different hues. And then you move this dot around inside the triangle to control the intensity and the brightness. There you go. Uh, so I've just totally inadvertently chosen the color for the Windows 95 desktop. So somehow that's apparently what we're making tonight. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so other stuff up here, there's this opacity slider. So let me show you what that does. I'll pick another, another color. Um, I'm going to drag that down, and then I'm going to bring my size up a little bit put the opacity to somewhere around uh, 50%. And you can see my color is set to yellow, and then as I 
paint over this, it starts off just as green, and then as I paint more, it darkens it in. Uh, so this gives you a sort of a semi-transparent brush. If you bring this down really low, then you can kind of like paint back and forth with it. And you see you can very slowly build up layers of color. things as well. One of the interesting things with Krita is that it doesn't have a separate eraser tool. Um, what you do is you click on this button that says set erase mode. Uh, the hotkey for that is just E on the keyboard. And so when that is active, oh, let's put the opacity back up again. You can see that it just goes and erases. Um, so this is kind of cool because what it means is you can use any brush tool uh, in Krita as an eraser. Um, so as we'll see, there's a lot of different kinds of brushes that will do uh, simulations of pencil or of, uh, of paint brushes or have different kinds of like really interesting abstract effects. Um, and you can use all of those as, um, as erasers uh, in addition to in pens just by toggling this option on and off. Um, let's see, a couple other neat things to see in here um, are these mirror buttons over on the right. Uh, so if you click this button, that's the horizontal mirror. You can see what that does is this cool little, well, mirroring effect. There's a slider right in the middle uh, that sets where the symmetry point is. Uh, so I can move this over here, and then it will draw things uh, around that axis. So I don't know, this is a super cool little thing. It's a really simple uh, tool, but uh, I think really, uh, really handy. Let's bring that over, over here. I'll do a little bit more editing on, on this guy. Um, and then, as you can see right here, there's also a horizontal mirror. And you can turn both of them on. If you want to make it. The, the second thing you made, the line next to one, I guess it was a dragon. Uh -huh. it was like the what, oh, this one over here? Yes. Oh, wow, how about that? I thought that was Richard Stallman. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yep, that's exactly it. Are you doing a Rorschach test now? Yeah. It is, it is exactly a Rorschach test. Oh, so you weren't intending on going for the food? That's what I thought. It could be that, or I don't know. Like, it, it, it's, all, it's all open to interpretation. All right, so this is some, yeah, so this is some fun stuff um, over here. Let me show you some of the other tools that we've got uh, along the side. So you have some shape tools. So there's this line tool. A square tool, circle tool, little polygon shape right there. A thing that's just sort of like a, a multi-line. You can see as I'm doing these shapes, the way that I'm completing them is double clicking. So each click creates one, um, one line segment and then double click completes the tool. Uh, and below that there is this little spline edge thing right here. If you combine that with symmetry, let's see you can do some cool stuff uh, that way or 
draw these kinds of paths. And you can see when I use this freehand path tool, it has this neat sort of like cleanup effect to it. So like, let's say I'm not super good at drawing um, and, or like I've had a lot of caffeine and my lines are kind of squiggly like that. It kind of cleans it up for me. Um, so this is one of the great cheating tools um, is, uh, is these, this freehand thing. So uh, it's also particularly useful if you're drawing with the mouse, um, where it's a little bit harder to get like a really clean, smooth line than it is with the graphics tablet. Um, so what that does is it kind of like automatically makes anything you draw into a nice curve. So I think that's super cool. Um, this is a, a technique that, that you may have seen if you've ever used Flash. Um, it was like one of the key things in the drawing tools in Flash. Um, and it's why like everything made in Flash like automatically looked good when that program came out and why everybody loved it. Um, is because it, it sort of like automatically cleans up your, um, your pen strokes. Okay, let's see what else was I was in here. Yeah, there's this insane thing called the multi-brush tool. Um, wow. Which is pretty fun. Um, let's see. Actually, hold on. I'm going to expand this out a little bit so it's a little bit easier to see some of these tools. Uh, so that's all in this all in this set of um, tools at the top. Um, the ones down below that, these ones are for transformations, um, moving layers, and cropping, uh, cropping your image. Down below that, you've got your paintbrush tool, sort of your typical fill thing right here. Um, the eyedropper, which you use to select colors. So you can see as I'm clicking around in the image, it's picking whatever color I clicked on um, and it's setting that to be my current foreground color uh, up at the top. Um, and then this gradient tool that you can use to draw, well, gradients. Um, that one will let you do gradients from one color to another um, or uh, between a color and a transparency. Um, this is really useful for a lot of stuff. Uh, you use this for doing sunsets, airbrushing effects, um, haze, toxic fog, um, and then it's also really useful um, can combine with masking techniques. So you can do these nice fades in, um, in mask effects. Uh, let's see, I'm going to skip these two for just a second and show you the selection tools down below. Um, so. You've got your regular rectangle selection, circle selection, this little thing which lets you do a polygon selection, um, magic wand tool which lets you pick things by color, uh, right there. Um, similar color selection which lets you pick everything in the whole image that's sort of a similar color. Um, and this other um, Bezier curve selection thing. Uh, so I'll come back to the selection things a, a little bit later when we get into doing layers. So this is what you would use to cop, cut and copy and paste different parts of your image around and work with different layers. Um, uh, let's see, and then this one, the assistance tool. Um, this is like a kind of a magic, an awesome grid thing that is really great for cheating. Um, and then the measurement tool, which is just used for, uh, for measuring stuff. So let's see, so I'm gonna, I'll come back to these in some more detail later, but first I wanna spend some more time just on the paint tool because this is where the majority of um, Krita's awesomeness is actually built in. It's all just inside the paintbrush here. Um, so to start experimenting with this some more, I'm gonna make a new layer into my image. Um, not that this first one wasn't awesome, but I'm gonna save it and just get a, a nice clean, fresh one. So you do this over in the layers palette over on the right. Uh, there is a little button down at the bottom with a plus for creating new layers. If you click on that and just say new paint layer, it creates a new layer right here. Um, 
And I'm gonna hide this layer I've been working on, layer two, by clicking the little, uh, a little eye icon for visibility to the left. And so now I just have layer three selected. And I'm gonna paint on that. Uh, okay, oh, um, there was one important thing to mention. Let's do one, one quick little stroke right here. So you can see this. So right now what, you've, what I've got is a foreground color that's this, uh, this mustard yellow and then a background color of white. Um, in this layer itself, I don't actually have any of that white. All of that white is in this background layer. So if I hide that for a moment and I look at layer three, what I have is this yellow and then um, a checkerboard, which means transparency. Um, so all that white in there is just what's on this bottom layer right here. All right, let's go ahead and erase that, uh, that thing there. I'm gonna change back to my default black um, and white for my paintbrush. And I'm gonna bring up my, my size just a little bit. Um, and I'm going to switch over to my graphics tablet um, right here because, as you can see, I can get a really different kind of a line by doing this. Um, so if you have your tablet set up um, correctly, what you should be able to get here is variable pressure giving you different sizes of lines. So if I draw really faintly, it's really thin, and then as I press down harder, then it gets, uh, then it gets thicker. Um, there are a whole bunch of uh, paint options and paintbrush presets uh, built in here. So, experiment with a couple, of, uh, a couple of these. If I pick this one that just looks like a pen down here, you can see and then I can use this to get some nice fine thin graphic lines or thicker ones like that. If I go to one of these ones that looks like a pencil. Yeah, I'm just looking at it. Oh, okay. Um, you can see what that's giving me is actually this nice sort of texture. So this is sort of like the effect of like taking a pencil and kind of doing like this sort of sideways rubbing. Um, Onto the, onto the paper. It gives you this little bit of a texturing effect to it. Basically, we kind of be like um, rubbing. Yeah, yeah, like, like doing rubbing. Um, let's see, what's another nice one um, on here? <laughs> Got a nice big. Spray paint? Yeah, it's like a sort of a spray paint or like dribbling dirty water all over your paper. One of the two. Um, this is one that will give you kind of like a, a little bit of a variable color effect. It's like a watercolor. Um, so there's all these presets in here. And as a shortcut, uh, in addition to grabbing them from that menu, you can also get them from the right click menu. So if you just right click anywhere in your canvas, you get this kind of quick pop up um, as a shortcut so you don't have to keep going over to the right or up to the top uh, of, your, uh, of your screen. So the right click pop up gives you the color selector right here. And then it also gives you two little buttons down here in the lower right, which are easy to miss uh, what these are. So the one over on the right gives you all these options uh, like the size and opacity. So it's the same stuff that's up here at the top. And then the one at the left will let you choose different categories of brushes. So if I set this to sketch, you can see three brushes show up right here in my radial menu, which are different kinds of pencils. So that one gives me a uh, almost like a number two pencil look. You can see it's not that dark, um, really fine. And if I, if I draw over it a lot like that, I can 
get some kind of nice shading effects. Going on like so. So when I'm like when I'm working on a piece, I'll I'll often start with this or with the uh, one of the pen simulation ones to start sketching in my drawing because um, it gives me like a nice thin sort of a line um, and it's very amenable to starting to work in the shading and that kind of thing. This next one is a slightly harder pencil. Uh, sorry, actually, no, sorry, softer pencil. Um, so this is this is darker. So you might begin with one pencil, like it gives you a very faint one, and then move to the um, to the darker pencil simulation to um, to draw over it like that. I guess I'm drawing like a soup can. Or a spaceman. One of the two. Um, Before you added the antennas, it looked like one of those in the hazmat suits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, let me go down to the, the menu right here. So that's the very bottom one is, is sketch. Um, if I change this over to ink, so these are all different kinds of pens. So you can have your, your kind of uh, really nice fine pointed graphic pen right here um, or a calligraphy pen ah okay yeah so my this is cool my tablet actually does control tilt so you can see right here the way that little outline of the brush is rotating so it's doing that as I'm sort of like tilting my hand from side to side uh, so if I tilt it over this way see what that line looks like or if I tilt it up and do another line it's kind of look like that so as I draw and tilt the uh, the tip of the brush back and forth, it will adjust the shape of the line. So this is, um, yeah, so this is a neat thing that's kind of like a, like a real calligraphy pen. Uh, if I go under the paint options right here, You can see that, that this brush does this interesting thing where it takes what's already on the canvas and kind of all smudges it together. This one gives you like a bit of a thicker uh, kind of a line. Yeah, like a, like a big fat Sharpie. Um, this one gives you, I don't know, it, it's like a semi-translucent or like almost like a watercolor brush or like a watered down ink. Uh, so you can so you slowly build up strokes like that. Um, and then this one's like a very, very large fill brush. Uh, the last one that I want to just mention in here is the the wet and smudge ones because these are also just kind of neat. Let me go ahead and just pick a different color so it's not just all black. But you can see what I'm what happens with this one is that as I paint with it, it's not all just one solid blue. It sort of smudges itself in with the colors around it, kind of like what uh, wet acrylic or wet oils would do. Uh, so this is, this is a really nice um, kind of an effect, being able to do that. Um, and this is, it's, it's useful for a lot of things, particularly in, in digital painting, because 
one of the things that you want to do is a lot of the time is get away from having just like a purely flat field of color. So anything where you're getting more shading or variation um, into the surface adds more visual interest and this is an easy way to do it. Uh, so these are just different brushes that all kind of have a similar effect, um, but slightly different texture to them. So this one will give you something like a, uh, like a little bit more of like a chalky look, whereas some of the other ones will give you more like a paintbrush look. Um, if you want to experiment with these some more, in the little box to the left are all of the settings. So uh, it, it's actually a, a fairly sophisticated, we call um, parameterized brush engine. Uh, so there's a ton of different settings, um, different kinds of textures that you can apply onto it, different parameters that you can control that will all adjust the behavior of all these brushes. So you can, um, you can really tweak and fine tune them to get the look that you want. All right, so before I go on, let me into um, making something a little bit more uh, coherent with this. Let me just pause for a second and see if there's any questions. All right, cool. Um, all right, so the next thing I'm gonna do is kind of like go through a little bit of the process of doing, um, uh, doing an illustration. I'm gonna start with some line art um, and then do some color fill layers and then some detail layers uh, on top of that. Um, and then along the way, we'll look at some different filters and effects that you can use. Uh, and also talk about some cool tricks that Critic has for working with the layers palette uh, over here that are particularly good for doing that, um, doing that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just make an entirely new document um, at, uh, at this point. Here, uh, I'm gonna go back to my sketching brushes and pick this um, basic pencil, get the opacity back up to 100% again, um, and start drawing. Uh, let's see, what should I draw? Oh, maybe I'll take some requests. <laughs> any, any requests for things to draw? Normal maps? Normal maps? Uh, okay, well, all right, I'll, I'll get to normal maps in a second. Um, yeah, but just like other like illustration things. How do you create tiling texture? How do you create a tiling texture? Um, let's see. So, well, actually, well, let me get back to that one also. But yeah, I just wanted yeah like another illustration idea. Any yes. any requests? Please have something. Yeah. Draw a what? Truck. A truck. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I can draw a truck. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right, uh, you want like a pickup truck or like a semi? Yes. Yeah, all right, um, pickup truck? Yes. Okay, all right, here we go. Um, I'm gonna do a pickup truck. So uh, now what I would normally do is kind of do some, let's look, do some reference images for that first. Um, let's see, here, I'm gonna look up a pickup truck. Because, you know, I think I know what pickup trucks look like but I might be wrong um, about that. Uh, that one's a pretty awesome one. Uh, let's see, where, where else? Do, 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 do. That's, that's pretty I good. Hmm? Uh, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that one. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, it's, it, it is on the list of best trucks, so I'm gonna grab that. Uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna copy this and actually bring this into Krita. Uh, let's see, it'll need some stuff about missing color profiles and whatever. That's okay. Uh, so I'm just gonna paste this in. It comes in as a new layer over here, um, layer three. I'm gonna double click that and name that truck. Uh, reference. 
Um, let's move this off to the side. I'm going to grab this tool that looks like a little, um, little cross with arrows. Um, this is also the middle mouse button. Oh, no, sorry, that's the hand to move the entire canvas around. Cool. Um, so let's move that over here. Um, and that way I'll just have this on the screen while I'm drawing. You don't have to do it this way. You could also just like have a second monitor with your reference images up there. Um, you can also just like take your iPad and have your images on that or, or whatever. Um, but since I just have the one screen to work with right here, I'll put them both together. Uh, if you want to really cheat, you can just like trace over the image right here. Um, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that. I'll be a little bit more daring and actually draw the thing freehand. So I've got my reference image right there. I'm going to go back down to layer two, which I'm going to double click and rename. Um, Uh, something like line art or a sketch, something of that sort. Um, and then you can go ahead and start to draw it. Now, um, if I want to sort of approach this analytically, I might try to like analyze what the different major forms are that are going on in this truck. I could do it by just trying to like replicate exactly the, uh, oh, nothing's happening at all, why? There we go. Um, the thing I did, did right there is I just moved the sketch layer up on top of the truck layer uh, right there so that the white that was in that wouldn't white out the sketch. Um, so I could do this by trying to kind of like follow it and draw a silhouette around the whole thing, which it's like probably not gonna come out looking so great. Yeah. Yeah, nailed it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Trash can. Um, over here. So what I might do instead is try to like an actually like analyze what these forms are. So what I've got right here is basically one large cube and then kind of another cube on top of that uh, angled out a little bit for the, uh, for the windshield and then the cylinders down here for the wheel. So you can kind of break it down into being uh, geometric primitives. Um, so the magic outline tool and the magic outline tool. Yeah, yeah, you could use the magic outline tool, um, and you could do things like, you know, I'll show you uh, uh, on this because it has this nice white background on it. I could use the magic wand tool, and I can click right here, and it'll select all of the white that's around it, um, and then I can go up to edit and choose clear, which is also just a delete key. <coughs> Uh, and you can see that leaves me like this nice uh, erase thing. And then, you know, if I, again, in sort of like if I wanted to cheat here, I could go up to select, um, and there's, let's see, where is stroke selection? Um, yeah, actually, it might be on a different menu, but there's a, there's a command in here that will just draw an, an outline around your entire selection, and so that would be um, another way to go about doing it, for sure. Uh, but I like I like drawing, so I'm gonna um, say uh, ah there we go thanks yeah. um, so what I'm gonna do is draw this or sort of like sketch this thing out as once you've done have a suggestion sure okay. Um, Kind of like sketch this thing out as this as this block, and you can see what I'm doing uh, is I'm changing it up a little bit. So the angle that I'm drawing this at is not going to be exactly identical um, to the one in the image, which is you know that's totally fine as well. I think that's going to get like be a little bit more um, 
a little bit more dynamic. And say, okay, that needs to come out a little bit more over here. And then this part. Yeah, but I'm just sort of like beginning it with this perspective cube um, as um, as the base of it, and then working off of that. Uh, and so then, you know, like once I have that, I can sort of like find where these important lines are, like this, like this line for the beginning of the windshield, and build up the form from there. Looking at this, I can see I think I need the front of the truck to be a little bit more elongated from that point. So I'll just like draw that out a little bit more over here. Um, and maybe I want the perspective for shortening to be a little more dramatic, so I'll make it bigger at this point and kind of come back a ways over like that. So, you know, I think that's maybe getting to the, the pretty good place with it for the basic, um, basic form. So, a suggestion? Yes. What, draw that thing? Yeah. Yeah, uh, let me finish the truck first. Ah, yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, now looking at this, we'd want to put the, go ahead and put the wheels in. Right, right there, and those need to be probably a little bit bigger. Um, and we build out what this stuff is gonna look like. Now this is like this very, very uh, thin, hard brush, All right? So I'm doing this with like a really fast, scribbly, um, kind of a line to just kind of draw over it a lot to uh, what I call kind of finding the form, right? So I'm not worried about making every mark, every line be uh, kind of exactly right. I'm just sort of looking at the image and then trying to slowly work, uh, work towards it. Yeah, I'm gonna go in here into a little bit of the uh, the grill. Get it into the headlight headlights there. Um, there's this kind of like really distinctive shape going on um, at that point with it. So you can see it's like very kind of cloudy and fuzzy um, in, uh, in this stage, what I've ended up making. I need to get the wheels down a little bit lower right there. So, so of course it's gotta be like much higher up off the ground. Um, an important detail to this is also, I don't know if you can see it too well, but like this sort of line that's coming across at this point, so I want to make sure to note that in here. Um, so what I'm doing as I'm as I'm drawing, as I'm observing, I'm looking not to capture every single detail, but to capture the things that are important about it that really give it its unique personality, right? Um, and with those, you could also, of course, exaggerate them a little bit. So I'm gonna stop with this layer. I think I've got like enough of the general form figured out. And then I'm gonna go up to perhaps another layer on top of that or um, just add this. So here I'll hit the plus and that'll add another layer um, and I'll switch to 
this darker pencil right here. The other thing I'm going to do at this point is zoom in a little bit. So there's this zoom slider down in the lower right that you can drag up. Yeah. You can. Yes. So that was, let me see, but, 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 where is that? Um, it is in uh, view and canvas. Uh, rotate canvas right and left. So control and right and left square bracket. I will do that. Yeah, so this is, this is really handy because what you'll, what you'll find, if you do a lot of drawing, there's like certain angles that your hand is just easier. You can find it's just like easier for a hand to do. So you can rotate the canvas over in a way that makes it like, so like that line is now like much easier for me to draw if I do that. I don't know why, it's, why I decided to do it in blue exactly, but yeah. But this is, a, this is an extremely, uh, extremely useful feature. Um, so with this slightly darker pencil, I'm going to go back in and continue drawing this and then draw on over this thing. And here, I'm going to kind of do a little bit of exaggeration. With the form, uh, I'm going to make it just like a little bit rounder than it is in the reference image. So it's going to have just like a slightly more cartoony feel. Then, you know, instead of trying to make it totally realistic, like a little more like Pixar cars, I guess. <laughs> you might say. So now that I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and hide the layer underneath that, the first sketch layer, so I can just work on refining this. A little bit. And so that'll give me a slightly more refined version of the, uh, of the sketch for this. So from here, depending on the style that I want to go for, I could do a couple of things. Like I could keep, continue working on this um, in a pencil style and do things like start to add in a little bit of shading. Do it like so. So you see what I'm doing here is this drawing over this with a very light, um, touch on the stylus so that I can build in a little bit of shading here and there. Um, and if I want to do something that has like a real sketchy style, I could just actually keep, like, like keep with this uh, entirely. If I wanted something with a cleaner illustration style, um, then I could do one more layer and do another pass over this using one of the ink pens. So let's see what that would look like. Uh, I'm going to add one more layer here um, and go back to choosing my brushes. Um, and I'll pick one of the, uh, one of the ink pens. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more for this. Um, oh, and then actually there's another trick I'm going to do first uh, before I do this. So, I'm going to be drawing this layer, this layer six, and trying to go over this with 
um, with a pen. Now you can see it's hard for me to tell what I'm actually doing because I'm drawing with a black pen over black pencil and so it actually all kind of looks the same. So I can't tell where I've drawn things and where I haven't. Uh, so a common trick for helping with this is to take your pencil layer and do a little bit of a color hue shift. Uh, you might actually do your initial drawing in like a blue pencil or purple or something like that so that your ink will show up a different color. But since I didn't think of doing that beforehand, and I've just drawn this in black, uh, I'm gonna apply a filter to adjust the color of this layer, layer five, um, away from black so I can draw over it a little bit, uh, a little bit easier. Um, so for that, I'll just go up to the filter menu. I'm gonna go to adjust, um, and let's see if I can get this to work correctly. I'm gonna pull up HSV adjustments. And there we go. I'm gonna check the colorize button down here, and I'm gonna bring up the saturation. So you can see saturation, a high value, gives me like this, like this deep saturated turquoise. A low value brings it back down to black. The lightness control, when you bring this all the way up, it turns it white. If you bring it all the way down, it turns it black. So I want that sort of in between. And then I can use my hue slider over here to pick which color I want to turn this thing into. So I'm going to do that for this kind of uh, greenish blue color like that and then hit OK. So now going back to layer 7 which is going to be my uh, my paint or my inking layer you can see now that ink shows up um, much more clearly on top. So I'm definitely not the steadiest like ink and paint artist. If I was, I would have like a totally different career in comics. Um, but I'm gonna do my best with this. Uh, just going through here, finding the main lines and drawing through them. Um, one thing that's a helpful trick for doing this kind of stuff is that you can extend the line beyond the intersection point, all right? So like if you're trying to draw something like a cube, like that, it can be hard to get these lines to like perfectly go from point to point. But if you draw it like this, where you're allowing your lines to go past the intersections, uh, it's actually easier to get control of the, uh, of the brush stroke. Also, it has that cool, like, I'm a CAD drawing type of look to it. You know, like, I made this in Autodesk. Um, it's a blueprint for something. So, anyhow. Um, yeah, and the reason is because you can always go back and erase stuff later on. All right, so, go ahead and draw the wheel wells into this truck. Um, so you have to forgive me. This isn't going to look super, uh, you know, super refined on here. It's just to kind of give an idea of the technique. Um, draw these bits. I think I've got almost all of it. Oh, yeah, I need to get part of the door. 
So it's, it looks, looks significantly worse now uh, <laughs> than it did before. It's sort of too bad, but oh well. Uh, anyhow, I'm gonna erase out some of the extra lines <coughs> over here. Um, like I said, I could make this look a lot better, but we'd be here all night. Uh, with the pen um, tablets, you see what I've got going right, on right here is, uh, uh, if you have the kind of pen that has an eraser on the back of it, you can just flip that over um, and it will turn into an eraser for you. Now let's do a little cleanup. This looks awesome. All right. Um, so I want to call this my line art layer, and then go from here into doing uh, the color, uh, blocking in the color underneath it. So let's name this layer um, line art. So we make sure that's done, and I'm going to go ahead and make another layer. I'm going to call this one color. And I'm going to drag that color layer below the line art one, or actually, you have to do it this way. Um, there's these little arrow buttons on the bottom that you can use to move layers up and down. And the reason I want to do this, so I'm now going to paint in some red into the color layer. said I'm going to paint in some red into the color look. That's odd. Yeah. yeah, there we go. Um, and you can see I can paint underneath the line art like so. I mean, like, I, got, I still got to do the highlights on here, but like, it's pretty close, right? Yeah. yeah. I think that the tires should definitely should just be all red. There's a saying in art: if you can't make it good, make it big, and if you can't make it big, at least make it red. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, what, what are some of the other colors in here? Oh, black. Okay. There we go. Um, yeah. uh, actually, that black is probably a little bit too dark. So keep in mind that this will be scaled down to about 64 pixels on a side for my iPhone game, so like it's okay that it looks like this. Here. 
an interesting kind of thing going on in the in the photo where you can sort of see these shadows of people inside maybe hard to see exactly what's going on yeah, let's get a little bit of that into it um, and let's illuminate that as well okay <laughs> so there's my color layer um, zoom this in a little bit do a little a tiny little bit of cleanup to it around the edges over here you know because like heaven forbid that we would color outside the lines now you erase inside the lines did i erase some inside the lines yeah oh yep you're right so i gotta go back in to fix that <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's get a little bit of this. Um, well, I want to get the I want to get this thing kind of like nicely into the um, into the lines for the next fabulous technique uh, demo here. Um, let's see, but let's grab that red color again and fill that in. Clean up that boundary a wee bit as well. All right, so that is my sort of first layer of color. Uh, now there's some other stuff that you might want to do uh, to this, like adding some highlights, some shading, and so on, once you've got your base color locked in. For example, if we look back at our reference image, you can see one of the really important things about this truck is this awesome highlight going along right here and down below. Like that's how you know this is shiny and amazing. Um, so maybe we would try to like get that a little bit of that effect into it as well. Now to do that, I don't know if I want to paint directly into my paint layer. Right, because this might take me a few tries and a little bit of manipulation, maybe two or three different layers to get get the look that I want. Um, so I really want to have another layer, like a highlight layer or a detail layer or something like that. So I'm going to go ahead and make that another layer right here. I'm going to call this one highlights. Maybe we'll try using one of the um, one of the paint tools for this, and use a, uh, use a white brush. You can see like the kind of effect that that's going to have. Um, I don't know where it'll kind of like fade out. Um, let's see where exactly I want this to be. A nice line going along. Sort of like right here. You know, so the highlight looks something like that. Either that or else this is just like a white stripe that's painted on the side of the car. Um, either way. Yeah, either, either way it, it, looks, it looks pretty great, right? Uh, Now the thing that I want to uh, I want to show you that's kind of neat with the layers in Krita is let's say you want to try to keep this stuff. Oh, I'm also completely messing this up because I actually am painting in the color layer, <clears throat> even though I made this other um, other layer, it somehow disappeared and I didn't actually paint into it. So undo all of that that I just did um, and ignore that. that stuff back in. Um, okay, so here's my highlight layer. Um, and so I'm going to try to do that, that white line again. But what I want to show you is a way of keeping that white line inside the boundary of the color layer that I've already made. 
So let me show you why this might matter. Um, down at the very bottom, I've got this layer one, this is my background, um, and it's just white right now. I'm gonna change its color uh, into a medium gray uh, right here. I'm just gonna go up to the edit menu and say fill with foreground color. So now I have that set to, to gray. And I'll go back up to my highlights, choose white um, to paint my highlights with. So like, let's say I did a stroke like that for my highlights. You can see how it goes off the edge right here. So not a big deal. I can always go and erase it, but kind of annoying. Like it'd be great if I could just make sure that all of that was clipped to the color that I have um, already in here. Uh, so in Photoshop, if you've, if you've used that program, um, there's this thing called clipping layers where you can create a layer that, that creates a clipping mask around it. Um, in Krita, the way that you can do this is using something called alpha inheritance. So if you look at the uh, layers palette, each of the layers has this little alpha signal, uh, symbol next to it. And you can turn these on to make a layer inherit the alpha the transparency map of the layer uh, before it. Um, and so what that does is I can make my highlight layer kind of like have its alpha locked to what's in the color layer right here. Wow, this looks super awesome if I turn off the lines. Um, so what that would mean is that then the highlights can't extend into anywhere um, in the paint layer that's in its alpha area out here. All right, so the way that you do this is you have to create a layer group. Um, so go down to the plus menu and say new group layer. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna call this one the uh, color group. Right there. And I'm gonna take color and drag that onto it. And then take highlight and drag that onto it as well. Um, yeah, and so there's a bunch of things you can do with that. Like, yeah, I can just turn all, turn all of them on and off. Um, I can change the opacity for all of them. So if I, you might split up the different colors in here. So you could have one layer for all the red, um, one layer for the color of the tires and so on, um, and group those together. Um, so this is actually different from how layers work in Photoshop and a lot of other programs. Basically, layer groups in Krita are kind of like their own image that all get composited together first and then inserted into the layer stack for everything else, um, which is really pretty cool. So there's a, there's a bunch of powerful things you can do with that. Um, and then, yeah, one of them is this, uh, is this alpha pass-through idea. Uh, or alpha inheritance. So let's say I draw this stroke across here on the highlight layer, um, and then I'm just gonna tap this icon for alpha. So what that means is it inherits the alpha channel of the color layer below it, and then as I paint on my highlights layer, you'll notice that I can like try to paint outside of it, nothing happens over here. Also useful for doing stuff like streaks on the windshield at that point. <coughs> that kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, so this is definitely like a really useful thing um, as part of your digital painting um, workflow to let you build up successive uh, layers of detail. Um, all right, so I think I'm going to stop there with uh, with this truck um, and and maybe move on. So, there's uh, any questions on what I've did so far? Okay, you want me to do that one? Sure, we can do that real fast. Cool, all right, this is gonna be like super complicated, um, but I like it. Oh, really, how did you do that?
Oh, on them? Yeah. Oh. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's... <laughs> okay, let's start over with everything because now you can see what I'm doing. All right, cool. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and make a new image um, over here. And let's see how we go about this. So those of you who can see what this object is, so this is this kind of... Uh, is it for like a crescent moon pendant? Or yeah, it's from my favorite movie. Oh, okay. Cool, all right. Sure, let's, uh, let's go for it. Um, let's see what I can do here. Uh, oh, okay. So, this would be a good one to use this tool, uh, the guides. Um, all right, let's see. What I can do with that. Uh, so what, I'm, what this is going to look like eventually um, Let's see. Um, this is kind of crescent moon shape. like that, with a little bit of a circle hanging inside it. So you can see my drawing of that is, is like quite terrible um, right here. Uh, because circles and curves are really hard to draw well. Um, so what I'm going to do to help me with that is use this tool um, over here, which is, see that one's the measure tool, I can't remember what this thing is called, but it's called something like the helper. Um, it's called a cheating tool. Um, and so what, this, what it does is it lets you draw out a shape of some kind, like let's make this one just a circle, perhaps. Um, or I can... How's that? Um, and... Then it will, or it should anyway, kind of snap to it. Maybe I need to turn that one on. Sorry, yeah, I'm actually not sure why that's not... Snapping quite how I wanted it to. Um, but what that should let me do is just like draw around it, so that made that a little bit less... a little less cool. Well, I'll do this a different way instead. Um, I just use the circle tool right here. Um, so make one of those for that um, for the central circle, and then I'm going to make another layer up here. And for the crescent moon shape, let's see. Let's go ahead and make one circle like that. I'm going to move it over. A little bit. And then do another one that's going to be you know, the inside part of it.
And so you see, as I move these around, I can find a thing that, you know, a spot that would give me kind of that, um, kind of that crescent shape right here. Um, so now I'm going to take those two layers, layers four and three, I'm going to merge them together, and then I'm just going to erase all of this extra stuff out here. Oh, oh too much. Oh no. So there's a number of different ways that you could do this. Other, another way would be using um, vectors, using the path and curves tools uh, to draw this thing out. Um, but this is just like a nice quick way of doing it. Um, and then let's turn that thing back on right there. Even like so. Didn't quite work out, but you know, kind of close. Um, and then from there you could go and draw in all of the extra stuff uh, in between it. Now this thing is, you know, it's extremely ornate, so it would involve a lot of like really drawing in all of the little curly cues, all this filigree uh, into it, all that detail. Maybe I won't do because there's quite a lot of detail in this and it'll, it'll take me all night. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, but this is pretty cool. And so I think what I might, I might do with this is then maybe try doing a pixel art version of it. That's fine. Because I think that would, that would turn out pretty well for, uh, uh, for a pixel art thing. So now I've got this kind of like, like blocked in a little bit. Let me do another... Uh, whoa, okay, that's weird. Another line on the inside. Um, right here, and let's say we did want to turn this into, um, into a pixel art thing. So for that, I would maybe like want to reduce this down to being a much more low res uh, version of this image. Like get this down to being, let's make it like a 128 by 128 pixel thing, uh, or maybe even less than that. Maybe do like a 64 by 64. Um, so for that, I'm going to first go through here, uh, grab the crop tool, and crop out just the part that I want, and then hit, um, hit enter. And then I'm going to go up to the image menu and I'm going to choose scale image to new size. So right now, conveniently, my dimensions are 60, 640 uh, by almost 640 by, by 623 right here. So if I bring this down to being like 64 by, well here it says 62 then it shrinks it down really small. So now this is like the size that I might you know, use it in a pixel art game um, of that sort. Let's go ahead and zoom in. Here's what it looks like at 100%. Um, right there. And here's what it looks, look, looks like zoomed in a whole lot more, uh, up to 400%. So you can see it has that nice blocky, pixely look. Like that. Um, now, to turn this into a proper pixel art graphic, um, I need to draw over this, again, in a nice hard edge, like one pixel pencil brush, um, so that it's not all soft and faded out like that, but has the nice like hard look that, um, that we want. Uh, for that, so I'm going to go back to my brush tool. 
over here and oh let's see i'm going to choose the pixel art category which is super convenient so this um, this one right here is a one pixel dot um, let's go ahead and change that back to uh, back to a black and i'm just going to go ahead and draw over this And um, oh, actually, I might have another brush that can help me for this circle, which is the Pixel Art Circle Brush, which just very conveniently draws a circle for me um, right here. Now I'll go back to the Pixel Art one dot and fill that in. I'm going to go to kind of a blue color over here. start going around this. Then I'll use the fill tool to go and fill that in. Got a brush to fill that. Choose like a nice gray with this, um, with the fill tool to fill that part in. Draw those little bits of it in there as well. Um, okay, now I can hide the layers that I've got from my original drawing and look at this. So now, when you're doing pixel art, one of the things you want to be able to do is see your image zoomed in like this, but then also see it zoomed out at the same time. Uh, so you can see what it's really gonna, uh, gonna look like. So here it is like zoomed way in, but here it is back at um, 100%. Right there. So it helps to be able to see both of those simultaneously as you're editing. Um, and in Krita, you can do this uh, by creating a new view of the same window. Um, now for this to be a little easier, I'm actually going to go ahead and save this. I'm going to call this, uh, this over on my desktop. Let's call this um, pendant. here and I'm going to close some of these other ones. Definitely saving that. <laughs> uh, I won't save that and so I'll just leave this one open right here. Then I'm going to go up to the window menu and I'm going to go to new view and so what that does is it creates basically another window with the same file open that you can have at a different zoom level. Now for this to be really useful, we don't want to have them just in two tabs together like that, um, but instead want to be able to see them next to each other. And this is something that you can change in the settings. Uh, so if you go up to settings, configure Krita, and then go to the window tab, you can see there's this first option, multiple document mode, that is set to tabs by default. So if I change that to sub-windows and hit OK, then it takes these two windows and makes them, well, two different windows in the same workspace. And so what that means is I can have one of them like this, let's say, zoom down to 100% like that and then I can take the other one and really go and zoom that in. So working on the zoomed in one I'm still using say the uh, the one pixel brush at least I should be anyway um, what I'm going to do is go through here and carefully draw in some shading on the gemstone that's in the middle right here. Incidentally, keep doing this, I just discovered that if you have a high definition screen, 
screen like I do. That very same menu windows has a checkbox that says support for high DPI. Oh, that sounds useful. <laughs> Um, so you can see I can I can do this to start painting in some shading for that sphere, and then I could also do like a nice little bit of a highlight right there. Need some highlights around that side, and then you can just like see it at both uh, at both levels as you're working. Um, okay, so let's see. Well, it's 8:40 already. Um, that was fun. So perhaps we ought to wrap up for the see, or we can keep going a little further. Uh, it's 840. Yeah. We can close out in line if we got time. Yeah, okay. Um, well, were you gonna get the painting textures? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about painting textures. Alright. Um, let's go ahead and save this thing. Can you save that Uh sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, are you taking off right now? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, uh, oh, oh, thanks. I don't know if we have any more USB. But can, can we send it to them later? later. Okay. All right, I'll leave your email. Wolf 21188 Gmail. Sorry, I have to go, guys. All right. Okay, so for doing textures, um, let me see if I can just remember exactly where the things are that I want to play with uh, in here. Um, All right, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna show you the thing that's that's the most unusual thing in here, which is the Fong bump map uh, filter. Um, so for this, I'm gonna go up to File, New, um, and I'm gonna go down to the Texture Templates. Um, let's see, I'll choose this one, the 512 by 512 8-bit sRGB. Open that thing up. Um, and in my settings, I'm going to switch this back to being um, tabs. So it'll be a little bit easier to work with right here. All right, and I'm going to go up to filter, map, and choose Fong bump map. Is that the thing I want? Right? Filter um, map. Yeah, so now this part, so I don't really know how to use this too well. I just discovered this last night, like at 2 o'clock in the morning. I was like, this is crazy. Um, so this is going to be a little bit messy. I don't know if it's really going to work out entirely, but let's try it. Um, so I'm going to create a filter mask right here, and then in Tools. Let me see where this thing, where this thing was. Um, so it's one of the uh, one of the paintbrush engines in here. The tangent normal brush. What? Yeah. Okay. So not sure if this is exactly going to work, but um, we'll try it out. So you can see as I'm painting over here on the right in the test area for this thing. What it's actually doing is painting normals. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. 
Okay. So our normal math is um, a video game technique where you have a 3D model and you can add, you know, texture, a lot of textures, and you just can uh, put it into it. Oh, okay. Normal math is a specific kind of image where it tells how light should reflect off of that surface. Oh. The direction of it. So, so therefore, that's why that's so exciting mm -hmm. because it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a low, you want a low quality as much as possible. So programmers and game engines like to group it by telling, well, instead of increasing the vertices, it's just create a texture that tells you this is the direction that the light should reflect off of this portion of the map. And so that's why we create, uh, that's why there's something called the normal map. As the name implies, it defines what the normal of that surface is. Does that make sense? So that's why this is so crazy and awesome, because you want to make your game look well lit, bumpy, and looking very alive. Basically, open source has now surpassed the private Photoshop commercial product. Yeah. So, just a quick, quick, yeah, quick explanation of what this, um, like, what what normal maps are and how they, like, how they work. Uh, if you haven't uh, looked at this before, um, so if you imagine the surface of something really rough and bumpy, um, wrinkles on fabric, for example, um, or like cracks in a stone wall or rivets on, on metal, that kind of stuff. So in your, in your 3D model, you want to have that usually like a much simpler low polygon thing. And then you use this texture map um, called a bump map or normal map or height map um, to include that level of detail. Um, one way of encoding them, that is called a, a bump or a height map where it's just a grayscale value where um, lighter colors mean higher up off the surface, darker colors are lower down um, on the surface. Um, normal maps work like this. So if you imagine this thing I'm drawing right now, this is sort of like an aside view of a surface right here. Um, and imagine light coming from this direction. Okay, so this side of it is going to be sort of brightly illuminated and this side over here is kind of going to be dark. Right? And the same on all of these little bumps as we go along. So the way that that gets computed is that you have this vector called the normal vector. Actually, let's draw this in red so it's easier to see, or like fabulous pink. Um, so these little arrows coming off of the surface at every angle uh, right here, these are the normals. And then if you have these light rays intersecting them, Like so, you can see that points on the surface where the light ray is exactly um, the opposite direction of the normal vector, those are going to be really bright. And then places where they're completely at a right angle, orthogonal, um, or like pointing the same direction, those are going to be shaded, those will be dark. Um, so you can encode these normals, these changes in the normals across something like, call this just like one single polygon right here. Um, and so encode that into the texture uh, as the normals will change across it. Um, so the way you do this is that for every point along this single polygon, you store a vector that represents how the normal should be, um, should be changed. If you were doing it just like this in two dimensions, each of those vectors would just be like one number. Uh, it could just be an angle or it could be two numbers because it's a two dimensional vector. We're doing this in 3D, so it's actually three numbers. It's an XYZ um, coordinate pair. So if you imagine like this little bump um, right here going off and then there's like this vector that's pointing off in space, it has an XYZ value to it. And what we're doing is taking that XYZ uh, coordinates, uh, set of coordinates and encoding those into the red, green, and blue channels of the image. Um, so what you'll end up with in a normal map is this weirdly rainbow colored thing, but all those colors represent angle directions.
So this is kind of helpful to understand to explain the, the first step we're going to do to make one of these. So I'm making a 512 by 512 texture. I click use this template and the first thing I'm going to do is change my foreground color. Um, and I'm going to type in some values specifically in here. So for red, I'm going to set it to 125, 128, which is 50% red. Then go down to green and choose 128 for that as well. So that's 50%. And then for blue, I'm going to set it to 255. So the reason I'm doing that is because those red, green, and blues are going to map to the X, Y, and Z um, coordinates of this vector. And so the 128 and 128 um, mean that it's basically just pointing straight up. So if like that red was zero, it would be the, it would be angled over to one side, um, or if green was 255, it would be angled um, on the other axis, on the y-axis. So this default color right here, 128, 128, 255, in normal maps means completely flat. So it won't change the normals across the polygon at all. So now what I'm gonna do is go up here to the, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, the brushes. And I'm gonna choose the tangent normal brush. Um, so it's, in, it's under brush engines. Um, just all the way at the bottom, just choose ch tangent normal down here. Oh, uh, you, you don't have to pick any of those particularly. So these are just like this is your tangent normal basic, tangent normal withdrawing angle, tangent normal hair. I don't know what that means. The single pixel one. Um, let's use tangent normal drawing angle. That sounds good. Um, and I'm going to bring the diameter down. Uh, let's see what that. Oh, I see what, yeah, what, what, what drawing angle does is it kind of, um, well, you can see how it kind of like rotates itself around as you're, um, as you're doing that. So I'm just going to use the regular tangent angle basic, actually. Yeah. Um, okay, and then just click off of that to apply it. Um, and drop the size down a bunch. And we'll just try drawing something with that. Um, so let's see if the angle does it. So I've got my brush angled one way, um, like leaning way over to the left as I'm doing these lines. And then I'm going to lean it way over to the right as I draw these lines. You can see that creates a slightly different look. So I don't really have a particular thing that I'm actually making with this, just some various different um, brush strokes. And then how will this appear when you Sorry? How will this appear when you add that little Oh, okay, right. So what this what this does is lets you paint a normal map. I'm gonna go ahead and save it. And do we have Unity on this? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. The yeah, we might as well. We can we can jump to that in just a minute as well to see what it would actually do. I have no idea if it's gonna work, honestly. But, um, well, um, well, the reason why I asked is because uh, you were able to add in the mask. Yes. So let me show you what that will do. Um, so I'm gonna save this first as just a .kra, and then I'm gonna hit the export button um, as well to save this out as a PNG. I'll 
also just onto my desktop uh, right here say okay now that other filter I'll show you what that will um, that thing will do so this other filter under here the fong bump map um, yeah it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit deceptive because it sounds like what it would do is make a normal map out of a bump map but that's actually not what it does. Uh, what it does is it loads a bump map and then applies that with a lighting effect onto your image. Um, so here, let's, let me show you. So I'm gonna choose Fong bump map right here. Um, and let's see, there should be a thing in here. Uh, channel blue material properties. Oh wait, maybe I actually just do that with the Maybe I actually do that with this this thing. Let's see what that does. Um, there we go. Fung bump map. Um, I'm going to turn on the use normal map option, um, and then go over here to the light sources. And so you can see what this is doing is as I rotate the light sources around, it changes the lighting effect because what these marks are representing are different bump, like raised um, or lowered areas um, in the image. So that's kind of neat. But let's go ahead and let's open up uh, Unity and just do a real quick experiment with that. If you sorry, say that again. And you just tap W. Yeah. Then it. Oh, then it wraps. Ah, okay. So that was the seamless tiling thing you were looking for. Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. Got it. So, yeah, so like if I wanted to make this thing tile and I want to have, whoa, what just happened there? Um, and if I wanted to have details that would come off the right side and then come back in on the left side, then what I can do is hit this thing W for wrap and then I can paint like that. <laughs> yeah, look at that. So, this is awesome. <laughs> For years, there's been this elaborate technique that I've used to do this, where you like copy and paste the image, and then you use the, what is it, like the pixel offset thing to like shift it over and make it roll around, and then you go in and you try to edit it, and then you offset it back again. Yeah, so this is, so this is extremely cool. Just tap W, easy as that. Yeah, so that's pretty neat. All right, so let's try loading up this, um, this Unity thing right here. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and, Thank you, Google. Yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and import that uh, normal map that I just made. Over here, uh, select that. I'm gonna look at it in the inspect. I don't know if you can see at all what this says on here, but um, I've imported in my texture, and then over in the uh, at the top in the inspector for that uh, for that asset. There's an option for texture type. I'm going to change it from default to normal map, so it will understand it as a normal map. Um, and then let's go ahead and create um, like a cube right there. Oh yes, I'll apply those settings. Um, and then I'm going to create a new material. Right there, and I'm going to drag my normal map. Um, I'll just do it this way. So, in the inspector for the material, there's an option for normal map, and I'll tap the little target next to that, choose the normal map that I just made, 
and then I'm going to take my material and drag it onto my cube. Like that. Yeah, so let's take a look at it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't oh, look like... Wow, it's yeah, that kind of worked. Um, uh, try to change it to the sphere. Like, click on the component. Oh, yeah. Render a component. Yeah. Yeah. Put some gear on the sphere. Uh, sorry, what now? Well, click on the game object itself. Uh, so, it says mesh at the very top under the inspector. The cube? Uh huh. So, yeah, you can change that to other. Oh, okay. Ah, right, all right. So, let's see how that looks. Is this Unity or open source also? Uh, Unity is a not open source, but it is a free game engine. So, there's no reason not to download it. There's almost no disadvantage to downloading this. They like expose every single feature that professionals can. Pay and people don't pay. Uh, you mm -hmm. I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Let's do. Oh, okay. So yeah, I mean this definitely needs like a little bit more refinement. Yeah, I mean like the, the fact that you can just do that is is actually pretty cool. Like there's only a few other programs I know of that you can do this in. Like Substance Painter is the one that I would normally use for this. Um, but having that built into an open source paint program is is pretty nifty. Uh, all right, so it's nine o'clock. Let me just show you one other thing, and we'll do this one really really fast. Uh, which is the animation stuff uh, in here. So I'm going to make another uh, simple little, little image. Oh, I guess, yeah, I guess I could do this one using the uh, animation templates. There we go. Yeah, English. Um, I don't entirely even know what to do with these. There's like so many different layers in here. It's very cool. Um, but let's go back to using just one of the normal brushes. Windows. So you actually, I've been told that you actually can run it in Linux uh, through Wine. So I would go ahead and give that a shot. Okay, so wait, where did the where did this thing actually disappear to? Sorry, actually, I completely lost this thing. Um, so, all right, so for doing um, animation, I need to bring up a couple of other, uh, other panels. So these are under, uh, where did I just find those?
oh, under settings, dockers. Um, so there's a, this animation docker and then the timeline docker um, down here. And you can also get this in the upper right hand corner. There's this layouts button that will bring up a bunch of default layouts. And so there's this one for animation that uh, brings that up. All right, so I'm just gonna draw one frame right here. Um, and down here in the timeline, every time you need to have a new frame, you would right click on it and choose new frame right there. Um, okay, so here's my first frame. And then here's my Second frame, and let's go over here to frame, this would be frame two. Choose new frame, and draw over it, um, and so on. Um, so you can see each one of these are kind of similar, but just like a little bit different. You want to be able to see the ones before it using onion skinning. There's this onion skin button over here in the animation tools. It says a setting that you can use to control how many frames before and after your current frame you want to show uh, with onion skinning. Um, and in here, let's see, I think there's a thing that I may need to do. in the animation to actually show the onion skins. Um, so I've got a little bit, a little bit larger. doing all those drawings on. Okay, yeah, that one. So you can see right at the beginning, right there, there's this little bit of movement. I can change my end frame over to like frame four. Um, so it'll be very short and just loop around like that. can bring the playback speed down a little bit like that. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's, it's really pretty straightforward. There's not too many other um, animation tools in here like doing uh, keyframed animation, tweens, that kind of thing. Um, but it gives you a completely robust system for doing frame by frame stuff. Uh, you have access to all of the layer stack uh, so you can animate per layer um, as well. Keep some layers uh, constant throughout. Uh, and so on. So you can really replicate a pretty traditional uh, like uh, animation workflow going from pencil test up to ink and paint and so on. Um, you know, laying out keyframes and going back in and drawing in in-betweens and, um, and so forth. Um, and you can, you know, you can uh, of course do this with a pixel art style um, or a sort of traditional drawn art style or, um, or whatever you want. 
Um, and then export all of those frames out and then run them through something like Texture Packer to create a spreadsheet that you put into Unity or um, whatever, whatever uh, game engine you want. So, okay, I think we'll wrap it up there. That's probably about enough for tonight. Um, so yeah, thanks. You've all been a really good, really good audience. I hope this has been, um, been of some use. Um, so, thank you. Uh, CHA.